My name is Susan McKay and I'm here with Elaine Hulanon at her home in Dublin to talk about her distinguished and ongoing career as a poet, translator, editor and teacher. And in particular we're going to talk about St Bridget's Day and also about Elaine's new poem to market. So Elaine, first of all, can you tell us a bit about St Bridget's Day? Well, uh, it's a wonderful moment in the year because uh, it's the entry into spring. Foreigners are always astonished that we start spring <laughs> on the 1st of February, but uh, it is a, a new beginning. Uh, I always think of Raftery's poem, Anish Teach uh, the This is the beginning of spring and after St Bridget's Day, I'm going to start and do things again. So for everybody in the country, I think it's there. It's also a rather particular festival. It has, of course, a root in Kildare, where St. Bridget had her monastery. It's uh, connected also with farming, with the health of farm animals, with households which were protected by the St. Bridget's Cross. Uh, it's a fire festival, apparently, which goes back to pre-Christian times. And uh, it, there are all kinds of local customs connected with the day. So your involvement with the St. Bridget's Day Creative Festival goes back to 2018, doesn't it? And it's closely bound up with your friendship with the late Leland Bardwell. Uh, can you tell us about how you came to be involved with Martina and the Hamilton Gallery on this project? Well, uh, Leland had written a poem about making Bridget's crosses, so it must have been written sometime at the, towards the end of January or maybe on St. Bridget's Day. Um, and Martina had the idea of asking a number of women artists to respond to it. And there was a big exhibition in London, which I was invited to uh, be present at and say something about the paintings and also about Leland, who was a very old friend of mine. So that's where it started. Well, I'm going to read that poem shortly, but in, to begin with, I'd love to you to read the poem that you wrote in memory of Leland, um, who died a number of years ago now, but whose centenary this would have been, 2022 would have been. Yes. Which is quite astonishing, isn't it? It's very strange to think, uh, because she lived to 94, and she had up to, I think, the last few years, she was so full of energy uh, and uh, I have the, the strongest memory of her as a, a creative and energetic person. The poem is called The Raging Foam because that was what they called the foam mattress which used to be dragged out when there was nowhere any, for anybody else to sleep in. And in all of her houses, uh, in Dublin uh, particularly, uh, there would always be odd people, including of course the poet Patrick Kavanagh, but lots of other people as well. Uh, who were dossing for the night or for a longer period. So the raging foam uh, for Leland Bardwell. She was born in February 1922, died in June 2016. Everything is late after an awful spring. The morning sun floating among clouds when it ought to be shining between those two tall trees the flesh, fresh blue flower that should be here to catch the light, making the minute real, not open yet. They miss their yearly meeting. I hear the news of her death and I wonder, the seat behind her house that was a sun trap right by the sea, the waves splashing and foaming on the rocks below, is the sun late there, is there only shade? The foam breaks and withdraws, it's a scatter of moments remembered, my life, her life, and I gather them all up, old scenes that are broken rumours, thrown high by the waves, the horses swimming to the pier, the baby in her cradle tossed into the waiting curragh. A segment I recognise, the foam, soapy water under a boat's side. And looking down now in the profound bay of memory, trying to guess how deep. I see her in a ladylike tweed coat, placing black spectacles to read in a clear ladylike voice the night Patrick Kavanagh died. Walk on serenely, do not mind that promised land you thought to find. 
I know the date Kavanaugh died. I know the date in 2013. We lost her on the train to Cork and found her again on the station, walking on serenely, accompanied by the remote jingling of the keys of all her houses, the voices of all the strays, remembering the floors they slept on, the unhooking in the small hours. And even in the late nights, when the house was full already, they dragged it out, the raging foam, for the last of the Lachicos with no home to go to. The wild girl in Leakslip, the mother in London, her children dancing half-naked in summer on Karl Marx's grave, the woman I rode out with in the Phoenix Park on the little polo ponies, which was later than some places and before so many others. I remember, or she told me, or someone had the story, but as the sea rises up to flood the pools between rocks, making one shining surface of rising water, where all the reflected lights floating shine together, they carry the glint of all the colours, the headstalls of horses, the written pages and her face. They are there with scraps and overnight guests and children, claiming, allowing no precedence, only the black cat crouches on its dry shelf of time, the last of a dynasty of kittens. Thank you very much, Lynn. It's a beautiful tribute. Um, I'm going to read that poem, St. Bridget's Day, 1989. Um, this is Leland's poem, uh, St. Bridget's Day, 1989. The women's calls go up across the lake, on this still day, their voices whip the air, staccato notes behind the reed-hushed margin. Winter is writing out its past before its time, while they trail the shore, anxious to garner reeds for Bridget's cross, bending in all their different flesh shapes, like shoppers to admire a bud, an early primrose, a robin shrilly calling to its mate. Although I gather rushes like these strolling women, I'm made conscious of the decades that divide us and that I should be celebrating Bridget in her strength of fruitfulness and learning. I can only offer her the satchel of these years. I too will make a cross for luck and irony. Amongst the witches' coven, I will raise my glass so my children's children's children will gather rushes for her turning. So that poem became a poem which Martina asked other uh, mm -hmm. women uh, visual artists to respond to. Can you tell us about how that how that worked then? I thought it worked astonishingly well. Uh, you could see so the thing was when you do this, you get so such a variety of responses. Uh, there was, for example, Geraldine O'Reilly's beautiful portrait of Leland, but there were lots and lots of other pictures that had picked up on one or another, on landscape, on uh, abstract forms like the rushes themselves, uh, on people and the way they re respond. I think there's something very visual in the poem itself. I loved the line you know, where the women are bending like shoppers, you know, the, the, where you suddenly have this uh, quite different modern uh, image superimposed on the, the landscape image. And on the flowers, yeah, yes. the wild flowers. Um, you, you, in the, um, when you wrote about that, you said, several of the female figures, this is in the artworks, appear to be in impatient motion. Some are stylized and still, but to me, they all carry the message of presence. We're here, we're not here only to be looked at, but to tell you things. Can you talk to us a wee bit about that? Well, presence is one of the things that I'm constantly returning to myself, uh, how people are present in different places and spaces. Uh, but also, of course, uh, with women, there is always this slight feeling that people are going to be looking at you and uh, judging you to some extent on what you look like. Uh, Leland herself uh, ha had went through various phases of looking different uh, from other people. Um, she settled down at the end, of course, into looking different because she was old, which is a much more comfortable <laughs> way of being different. 
Uh, but I think she had a sense in, in that poem too of, uh, and I think it's something that women artists pick up on because they're making images, uh, but they don't want to be considered to be images themselves, I think. Um, you wrote of the poem that it shows the poet as an observer half outside of the culture that she watches. Is that where you see yourself too, as, as an artist? Yes, well, I think it's half outside. You're, you're, you are inside, and yet you must get a perspective. You must find a point from which you can see the most, or which you can see as much as possible anyway. And that means, you know, like a photographer going back and back and shifting slightly and ending up not quite outside what you're looking at. I think that's what visual art does. It's what uh, verbal art does as well. Yeah, and she writes about it in the poem as well, doesn't she? That she's, mm. she's watching it, but partly with irony mm. and partly for the future. Yes, I, I, the irony sort of suddenly comes in mm. there, doesn't it? And it's real, though. Um, could you read us one of your poems from one of your earlier collections? It's not going back to your, your teenage days, it's from the 1970s. Uh, Lucinda Shinning in Silence of the Night. Yes. If um, I've pronounced that properly. No, I, I, I'm never sure myself how to pronounce it because, of course, it's not in English. It's a quotation from a poem in Scots um, by William Dunbar. Uh, this, I, I wrote this in some, sometime in 1970, I think. Uh, and uh, I, was, I, had, I had run away from Dublin for a weekend just to sit in a falling down cottage belonging to my cousins and get some reading done. Moon shining in silence of the night, the heaven being all full of stars. I was reading my book in a ruin by a sour candle without roast meat or music, strong drink or a shield from the air blowing in the crazed window and I felt moonlight on my head clear after three days rain. I washed in cold water. It was orange, channeled down bogs, dipped between cresses. The bats flew through my room where I slept safely. Sheep stared at me when I woke. Behind me, the waves of darkness lay, the plague of mice, plague of beetles, crawling out of the spines of books, plague shadowing pale faces with clay, the disease of the moon, gone astray. In the desert I relaxed, amazed as the mosaic beasts on the chapel floor when Cromwell had departed and they saw the sky growing through the hole in the roof. Sheep dogs embraced me, the grasshopper returned with lark and bee. I looked down between hedges of high thorn and saw the hare absorbed sitting still in the middle of the track I heard again the chirp of the stream running. Elaine, can you tell us about your work as an editor of Ciphers? And in the past, you worked there alongside Leland Bardwell and also your late husband, Macdara Woods, and the late uh, poet, Pierce Hutchinson. Yes, uh, I'm the survivor. That's the price that you pay for being old. Uh, but it seems worthwhile continuing and we're aiming to get I have some uh, assistance at the moment. Uh, my, my niece, Leanne Nicholanine and Natasha Coddington from Belfast both helped me out with it. Um, and we've recently created a searchable archive of the, the, all the issues to date and we'll bring it up to date. I've been, so I've been looking through all the back numbers and really we've produced a lot of very interesting and some very excellent work. So it has been worthwhile. It's also striking that um, Cyphers has always um, represented the poetry of women uh, as well as men. Is, is that anything to do with the fact that two of the editors were women, yourself and, and Leland? Because you were coming out of a period in Irish poetry where most of the poets who were noted were, uh, were men. Yes, I think that's right about the beginning of our... We, we started in 1975 and we always looked out and tried to publish women poets, 
but there certainly have been, there are many more in later decades. Some of the people who were young then have come along and uh, have become very well known indeed, people like Maeve McGuckey and Mary O'Malley, for example. I don't want to give a list, but it has been one of the things that's made to some extent easier. Not always though, I mean, sometimes I'm looking at a pile of uh, poems and I think, uh, why aren't there more women here? So it's, it's still something you, you need to look out for. Mind you, get, you get bad poems by women as well, I hasten <laughs> to add. Um, do you think that literary magazines are really important in the world of poetry? Yes, I think so. I think uh, people don't begin to take themselves seriously until they're published. And you don't get published as a book usually first. You, get, you usually start off with magazines. And when you see a poem in print, it looks so different. And you begin to think, gosh, this is, this is something I'm really doing. And I think that is a, a very important phase in somebody's career as a poet. It makes them, I think, pay attention. Um, that obviously isn't an issue for you any longer. You've published many, many collections. Uh, do you know how many collections you, you have actually published at this stage in your career? It depends how you count, but I think there are 11. So uh, yes, I mean, there's, there's a selected and now a collected as well. Can you read us a poem of your own choice from your collected poems? I'll read a poem which I like, even though it's a little bit gloomy, uh, because it's one of the poems I wrote after my husband died. Um, but it's, it's about uh, every year when we went to Italy, we always drove. And when we got to Genoa, you drove over an extraordinary elevated motorway, which had a terrible spiral at the end. And we always drove very slowly because there, were always, there was always too much traffic on it. And it, we thought this is one of the triumphs of Italian engineering, which indeed it was, but it was not properly maintained and it fell down in the same year as McTara died. And I, it was one of these moments when somebody dies when you think, I must tell him, and then I realised I couldn't tell him about it. So it was known as Il Ponte Morandi, so it, the poem is called The Morandi Bridge. Let me lean my cheek against this limestone pillar. I want to press until I feel the buzzing, the sound the world makes when it isn't going anywhere, a purr of grey transparent wings hovering in one place, a humming to itself because it needs to lie still, stay quiet and recover and who will bring help. The noise when the bridge fell down in Geneva, the road you and I drove along slowly heading east behind a small fiat, packed and weighed down with people, cake and flowers for a mother-in-law who made a Sunday lunch. They were taking their time. It was lunchtime again each year when we reached the bridge and the families were always on the move. So we'd drive along slowly those 15 minutes, high up over the factories and streets. I would tell you this news if the stones of the world could carry language, but after eight months, the shock and the noise inside them still, they cannot move or even allow a message to pass through. Thank you, that's a very beautiful poem. Did you, did you write many poems uh, in memory of, of your husband and indeed of all the other friends uh, who, as you've mentioned, have, have died? Well, I, f I do find myself writing poems uh, in those circumstances. Again, it's one of the penalties for surviving. Uh, I don't set out to do it, but I've written a few poems about, um, about Magdara, of course but also about the sense of uh, loss, of a sense of proportion that happens when somebody dies or is very ill. I remember when he was, he was very ill f five years before he died, then he got better. Uh, but the cat was very sick at the same time. And I remember, you know, really going from the hospital to the vets <laughs> and back again and thinking, 
one of these is not supposed to be important, but it did seem to be important, you know. So that that feeling of disorientation, I suppose, that comes about when somebody's ill or dies. Thank you. Um, your poetry is now taught as part of the, the leaving certificate, uh, the exam for children who are 16, 17, uh, just finishing up at secondary school. Um, do you like that? Do you like the fact that your poems are now being taught? I do rather. Um, I think I was a bit taken aback when I was told first, but it's a new audience. Um, I think uh, not all teachers uh, like the poems, <laughs> but the ones I've met have been enthusiastic because that's why I met them. Um, it's also, I think my poems are sometimes difficult and I was surprised how much people seem to like getting their teeth into, you know, deciding what something is really about and making their, making their own of it. Um, you, of course, were a teacher yourself for many, many years. Um, you were a professor of English Renaissance literature at Trinity from the 60s until 2011, I think. And then you were the professor of poetry for Ireland from uh, 2016 to 2019. That's a long stint of teaching. Uh, do you love teaching? I do. I, I do love it. I'm not sure that I'm a terribly good teacher. Uh, <laughs> I think I... Uh, I'm inclined to tell people what I think they need to know uh, and there are other people who are good at for example teaching people to develop their own talent as writers and I don't think I'm good at that but I, I do like the earlier period and I have lo very much enjoyed teaching classes on translation uh, that because partly because the students were really interesting and interested so that was a, 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 a good challenge. I've, I've had some wonderful students. I have to tell you that you taught me, uh, but I was a truly terrible student, so um, <laughs> it was nothing whatsoever to do with your abilities as a teacher. Um, in 2010, when you won the Griffin Prize, um, the judges spoke about um, your transformative imagination, a certain magic that enables you and your readers, as they put it, to move between worlds. And I noticed just from the poems that you've read that that's going on all the time, isn't it? I mean, that hair that keeps turning up seems to me to have some sort of significance uh, beyond the immediate presence of, of that animal. It is a thing that characterises your poetry, isn't it? That moving between different worlds. Yeah, I mean, the hair started very much as a literal hair, but I do notice that she, tends to crop up all right. <laughs> I think uh, I've always been interested in the way one world seems to be superimposed on another, the way something is happening but something else is happening as well and uh, that's usually what starts me off on uh, writing a poem, that I, I see um, two things together and, and think what is it that connects them, why am I connecting them. Sometimes that can seem to be quite random and then when I look a bit closer I see there is a real reason for me. And I don't write unless there's something that's really pressing me to say so that's the moment when I feel I should try to catch this. You spoke in a very early interview about um, how you constantly ask yourself is this real? Is that still a test for you? Oh, I think so. I think, um, do I really want to say this is, is a question. Uh, and also, am I using words that are appropriate? Uh, but also, you know, am I exaggerating? I, I, I don't want to say more than I mean about anything. So quite often there's a, a, a sort of rather devious way into a subject which I think is, is just necessary for me. It may not be for everybody. So this, this new work that you've been doing with the Hamilton Gallery and on St. Bridget's Day, um, that moves you very much into the world of visual art because it's, again, as with Leland's poem, it's about how your poem was responded to by, by artists. Um, do you feel at home in that world? Is, is visual art something that's, that's important in your life? Yes, it has been all my life. Uh, I think even in Cork, 
Um, I think I was even very early conscious of the fact that Ireland is fairly deprived in terms of visual art, even though there's a very good art gallery in Cork. Um, there's so much historical things that are missing. For example, when you go to the continent, there's the whole panoply of Catholic religious art, which has meant a lot to me and it just do, do, doesn't exist here. So many places were destroyed. You know, there's a, a shadow of a fresco somewhere like the Rock of Cashel or the, the O'Malley Castle on Clare Island. And you think, but there was much more there at one time and it's just all gone. So it's, uh, it's both art and the absence of art, I think, that have meant a lot to me. There's a huge difference, of course, between the way that art is so um, celebrated in Italy and the way that it is rather neglected here in Ireland, is, isn't it? I think it has been, for example, the way you're taught it at school. Uh, I think it's quite different, for example, from the way music is taught, even though there are obviously gaps in music education, but still uh, th there's a sense that music is important. Uh, I don't think that there's a, still a general sense that the quality of art is terribly important. Um, the, the, that there's a, and I think that, that ties in with lots of other things like architecture and town planning and so on. The, the, the value that we have for what you can see is not as, as uh, high as it should be. Um, as we speak, um, there are some 19 works of art that are crossing the world by Irish uh, women who are artists and they're on their way to the Irish Embassy in Beijing where Ambassador Anne Derwin is going to welcome them as part of the St Bridget's Festival. Now these are works from the 2020 celebration of uh, Eva Gorbuth, mm. uh, who, another great Sligo woman. In the catalogue for that exhibition, President Michael D. Higgins speaks of her as a quite extraordinary figure, not just in Ireland's revolution, but also in the international trade union, suffrage and peace movements of the last century, and yet one whose memory has been somewhat obscured in Orthodox Irish historiography. Um, why, first of all, can I ask you, why do you think her memory was so obscured? Well, I think that one of the things about women poets uh, and I, you know, I, I wouldn't say that it has come to an end, uh, is that there doesn't seem to be an ancestry. Uh, it's almost as if we have to keep inventing the wheel. Uh, and so we don't look back on the poets of earlier periods as much as we might. Uh, and I've often thought that we don't value them properly. Uh, there's a wonderful poem by Eva Gora Booth, uh, women's Trades on the Embankment, which is one of the few really good political poems that I can think of in the world, where she suddenly talks about uh, you know, having been told that women must have patience before they get the vote. And there's a line in it, no, oh human soul, no patience anymore. And I thought, here's somebody who's writing out of this conviction that things have to change and they have to change now which is, a, a, you know, it comes up every now and again, and it is real. And I thought, how mar I mean, the whole poem is wonderful. I don't know it by heart, but there is a marvellous feeling about in, in, in that. And I think she's well worth resurrecting and remembering uh, as a poet, as well as a writer. President Higgins also spoke about her uncompromising ethical drive and, and her idealism. And he commented that she fought many battles, that she didn't live to see one. So that very much fits in, I think, with what, what you're yes. talking about, with women mm. taking on that mantle without it necessarily being acknowledged that it was there for the taking. Yes, I think that's right. Um, as, we're, as we're talking here today, uh, Elaine, um, Ireland is covered in new uh, shrines which have been put up by women and, and by men, women and children, indeed, to a young woman called um, Ashling Murphy, who was murdered as she ran along a canal bank in County Offaly. And strangely, in fact, there is a shrine or a memorial along that canal bank to another young woman who was murdered uh, in 1996. We're very attached to putting up shrines in this country, aren't we? 
Yes, uh, a shrine seems to be a way of making a place in some way sacred and making it a centre, so, uh, something around which people might gather uh, or near which people might gather. It's, it's, a, it's a marker um, that's more than a marker. It's a, it, it's a, it's a magnet, I suppose. Um, I think that uh, you, there's a lot of vernacular shrines dotted around the country. Um, I mean, I was talking about the absence of one kind of Catholic religious art, but there obviously is that other tendency to uh, create something small for a reason which may be private or, or which may have meaning to a particular family or a particular uh, area. Uh, and I think, it's, I think it's important, partly because it's not terribly explicit. Um, the shrines I visited when I was writing the St. Bridget's Well uh, were sometimes quite explicit. They had, had uh, plaques up saying, uh, please remember and pray for my aunt, giving her name and dates. Uh, and others where there was just um, the tree and the few little statues and uh, the rags tied to the branches. Uh, and that was a, a different uh, way of just saying this place means something to somebody. Let's talk about that quest that you went on to, to find St. Bridget. You talked about an earlier quest, which seems to have, as you put it, culminated very quickly with hot whiskies in a pub. But <laughs> <laughs> can you tell us about your more recent quest to find the presence of, of St. Bridget? Well, it, it was very interesting because I had, I, I thought I'd start in Kildare because I knew that there was one there at Kildare Town and a few others sort of dotted around the place. but. Um, then I was talking to a friend who was brought up in Clondalkin uh, and she said, oh, there's one in, in Clondalkin, which is a very ordinary Dublin suburb until you get to it and see the round tower and the, uh, there's a, 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 a castle not that far away from there. So it turns out to have a, a, an ancient identity. And when I asked about St. Bridget's Well, everybody knew where I was going. You know, when, you look, when you're looking for something, people don't necessarily, they often stare back at you, never heard of that. <laughs> but this was quite different. Um, so that was one place uh, that I went to. Uh, and then I had this, I overheard this rather extraordinary scrap of a conversation. And what I thought about was, um, if you if you look for something, you always find something slightly different, and that was what really fascinated me about this about being on a quest. I wasn't looking for the Holy Grail; I was looking for whatever I might encounter along the way. Uh, yeah, in your introduction to the the brochure which accompanies the exhibition um, arising from your poem, you talked about overhearing stories, phrases parts of conversations, three women planning a wedding, a grandmother watching her grandsons jumping over a stream, and a man who pressed a bottle into your hand claiming that it had already cured him of two brain tumours, no less. Um, and you said in the poem, you said, I wrote, I couldn't cram all those details inside the boundaries. But the images that you did include included circled loosely around the image of the well and the fame of Bridget remote but radiating power still a millennium after a millennium and a half welling up out of history. I wonder, could you actually read us that poem now? Surely. St. Bridget's Well. When I asked the way to the well, people knew what I meant, and at last I found the place. There was a tree with rosary beads and white paper twisted around the branches. I watched a girl who arrived just after me wearing pink trousers and bright red sandals. She came in from the road. She stood and prayed and reached out, touching a stone, then moved a few feet to the right and did it all again. Just there, the path was a shortcut from the road to the houses. People passed with their shopping, heading home. One woman with a child. I heard her saying to the child, 
walking along in her school uniform. It's for all the little babies that passed away. I wrote her words down that same evening to be sure I had the truth. It was three in the afternoon, Wednesday in the month of June. I had caught her answer to the question I didn't hear in among the voices, the cars on the road, the soft slap of the sandals, the silent visitor wore, the children coming from school. Well, I thought, who needs apparitions? But they came anyway in spite of me, rising like steam out of a dark patch on the road, or more like the burning smell from a dark patch on an old door. If I wanted a map that would just show the wells, the culverted streams, the shortcuts, they came, they congregated, they insisted. What about the wall where the girls played one, two, three O'Leary, they said. I said, why do you want me to put that in? Our lovers walk, they said. I gave them back their stare. What about the swan, said I. I saw her just now in my search, so close to me through a gap in the high wall, her head, her bending neck, white feathers of one wing. How could she nest up there and seem at ease? But when I turned to leave behind the dead end and come down again beside the factory wall, I heard the mill stream splashing downhill inside its prison pipe out of the brimming pond that I had not seen. Could I have forgotten the excess of water, the excess of all the stories I might have heard as I searched for St. Bridget's Well? Thank you. That's lovely. And that's a, that's a brand new poem, isn't it? That's especially for this uh, St. Bridget's Day celebration. Yes, indeed. Uh, I was prompted by Martina and I thought I can do this. I, I, this is something that would interest me. But then I had no idea, of course, what I would actually find. Is it your practice to converse with these apparitions? <laughs> well, I suppose the, the apparitions are partly one's readers. You know, they're, 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 sometimes they're saying, why does she write that poem instead of a different one? Um, and then there are all the people that I don't know about, but, but that I, I haven't directly heard about, but I, I know they're there. Uh, it's part of uh, any, anything where you, you try to focus on one symbol, like a well, which is a very obvious symbol. Uh, and it seems by doing that, you're removing your focus from something else. It's a bit like these uh, glasses, these multifocals, you know, where you're, you're always seeing something that's out of shot. Um, just we're, we're coming to the end of our conversation now, but I just would like you to tell us about the most recent uh, poetry prize which you won. Well, uh, that was something that just came out of the blue. It was, uh, it has to do with the Munster Literature Centre, which is um, connected with various uh, places in China. Cork is twinned with Shanghai, I hope you knew that. Uh, <laughs> They, they uh, had this idea that uh, th they'd make a connection, I think, with this festival. And lo and behold, the festival came up with a prize, um, which consists uh, partly of a nice cheque, but also partly of this uh, mythical, as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> bottle, uh, well, legendary, let's say, bottle of liquor, which is still uh, in Beijing being minded by my translator. I had a wonderful year corresponding with this man, Hu Wei, who was uh, writing back and forth about the poems, and I was able to see them in this new light. They brought out a book, uh, which uh, I have copies of, uh, and it's, uh, it's wonderful to think that with a place so far away that poems can reach and be changed through, of course, the skill of the translator, who uh, obviously read those poems inside and out. And really, the questions he asked were so extraordinary, they sent me back and made me think again about them. So it was a marvellous experience, even though I wasn't able to go to China and collect the bottle, but maybe I will someday. <laughs> 
Um, just to finish up, I'd, I'd like to ask you if you would read um, a few paragraphs from the introduction that you've written to um, the uh, brochure. Yes. Um, it's about the, the variety of images in the exhibition. How striking then to find such a plenty of images in these artists' work, which flow from the same source in all their variety and strangeness, dark with mystery or challengingly bright. I find it slightly bewildering how freshly they remind me of those two crowded days of my quest in Kildare, when I was passive, merely looking and listening and astonished at how much there was to see and hear if one allowed it to happen. The artists have made something quite new in every case. They've heard an echo in the words, the echo perhaps of what was not said, and they've made images of what cannot be seen. Water is the perfect image of what can't be represented, transparent, sinking into dust and sand and soil, thirsted and sought for, but only made visible by its contexts, its courses and wells, the sky and the faces it reflects as it dissolves and submerges and changes everything. Water is like everything and nothing, and the triumph of the image maker is capturing and revealing it. Here too are hiding places and hidden secrets, dawns and twilights, and the multiplicity of light, places and their weight of history. I can only salute the fine invention and the skill that displays so many unseen mysteries. Thank you so much, Elaine, and uh, we look forward so much to saluting your future work and to enjoying the, the exhibition that accompanies you, your wonderful poem. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>